Baruchim Avim, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Bet Gavrim. Oops, I'm sorry, I'm so used to Bet Gavrim. To the to Bet Eliyahu congregation, where tonight we have the honor and privilege to hear from Rabbi Pesach Pro, Rabbi Walt, please. Before we begin the evening, we want to mention a few quick updates and announcements regarding upcoming Chazak events and programs. But before I do that, I want to stress that tonight's event is dedicated Li'ilui Nishmat Ha'ishak Shera Liza Racha Bat Tzia Ruach Hashem Tenechev Begin Eden. Amen. Well, I will tell you just a few quick words about the, the Niftar. It should be known that Liza Racha Bat Tzia was born in Russia in the year 1948. She had a very, very spiritual soul. She had a very hard life also. As her father passed away at a very young age and the children were left to take care of the mother and themselves. So you can just imagine how difficult that was. In 1979, she left Russia with her family and migrated to the United States. At the time, she started working in the Jewish community as a nanny and, one, and was one of the first to become religious in her entire family. Lisa Bracha was a very kind and optimistic and caring person and always wanted to do mitzvot. She always believed that Hashem had a special plan for her. In 2007, she was unfortunately diagnosed with cancer and fought a tough battle. In 2011, she lost her battle to the Machala. She always believed and thanked HaKadosh Baruch Hu for everything that came in her way. Not one day did she say any of us why is Hashem doing this to me? Leah Bracha, Liza Bracha, sorry, lived only 63 years, but had accomplished so much in her short life. She has left her three children behind to continue her legacy, spreading to the world uh, Hashem's message. I just want to thank her sons, Baruch, Yaakov, and Rosa. They deserve a round of applause, Benet, for organizing all of them tonight. Thank you, Baruch. Thank you. Yaakov, thank you, Rosa. God bless you. And it's a message, it's a lesson for every single one of us. Many times when people do Yeshua's, when they do yard sites as Karot, they fill up tables and they, 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 uh, they do these uh, rent out restaurants. And uh, in my opinion, many, much of the time it's a waste of money. But these three brothers and sisters, what they decided is we're going to organize a shiur, we're going to inspire the community, we're going to make people's lives change in order for our mother to have an aliyah neshama. So, Bemet, thank you very much once again, and we should all learn from their ways. Regarding upcoming programs and events, a week from tonight, Chazak will be organizing a major Lagba Omer extravaganza at the Bedkarel Center in Forest Hills. We have Rabbi Mizrahi coming. We're going to be having music, dancing, food. We're going to have a lot, a whole program. It's starting at 6 p.m. Come, enjoy. It's going to be an unbelievable evening. And whoever's looking, has a yard set coming up or anything along those lines, please come let us know. And by Ezrat Hashem Tibrach, with Hashem Tzav, we'll organize Shiurim and we'll inspire the community. We'll take things to the next level. I could go on and on about the different programs, but I just want to stress one last one. The last program that, uh, the latest program that we started is something called Chazak Radio. What's Chazak Radio? You go online for now, chazakradio.com, and uh, we're going to be having a Mitzvah Hashem with God's help, 24 hours shows. There's going to be a sheer about, there's going to be a show about stories, there's going to be another show about Alakha, another one about Parsha, another one for Kids Hour, another one for news. Many people go to secular sources for news. But that's we're going to have one that's not going to have all the Tuma that's in, involved with it. And Bezat Hashem, it's going to be uh, a major, major force all over the world. Baruch Hashem, we just started. Just to test it out to get an idea how it goes, we just put some music. You know, 24 hours. Obviously, during the Omer, we have a cappella. And believe it or not, already over eight countries are listening to it. Baruch Hashem, thousands of people are going on it. And it's, it's going to be great. So Bezat Hashem, for now, it's online. Chazakradio.com. We're working. And if anyone has any connections to get it on air, um, my goal is to have 6.13 a.m., you know, something like that, interesting uh, dial. And Rezat Hashem, after the radio, we want to do something along the lines of Chazak TV, where it's going to be, again, 24-hour shows. Instead of people turning on the television, they'll go online to ChazakTV.com. Maybe we'll get a channel, who knows? Hashem has plans. And uh, we're going to have kosher entertainment for the whole community. Without further ado, it's my honor and my privilege to call upon my very, very good friend, Nidin Nafshi, 
very close to He has inspired thousands upon thousands of people on a yearly basis, sometimes daily. I know he spoke in Brooklyn recently, he spoke at our big event, and the man is unbelievable. He's a moal, he's an author, he's a speaker, he does so much. God bless him. Without further ado, round of applause for Robin Pays up, bro! It is a great schus to be here as part of Chazak. Anytime I speak about Yaniv, I think that he's one of the rare people in this universe who is so young and so capable and has inspired so many people with all his programs that Hashem should bless him and his family for everything that they do for Chazak because really that's the perfect name for the organization. They give Chizuk literally to people throughout the world. Hashem should bless you. Amen. Tonight, We've come in Beit Eliyahu. I've had the opportunity, Baruch Hashem, to do many britot here, but this is the first time that I'm speaking, so it's very special for me. And tonight we just heard that this is going to be Lezecha Nishmas, Liza Bracha Bas Katsia Nisanov, a wonderful lady. I understand that she has grandchildren in my wife's class, twins, right? So I'm gonna go home and tell my wife that the twins tomorrow should get 100 on the next test, no matter what. <laughs> And of course, there's a great organization in the world that literally, wherever I go, wherever I go, last Shabbat, I was in Australia. That's more than 10,500 miles away from here. And they know about TorahAnytime.com. You go to Chile, you go to Mexico, Switzerland, England, Canada, all over the world, they know about TorahAnytime.com. So Hashem should bless all those that sponsor TorahAnytime.com and those that listen to it and those that give shiurim. Hashem should bless everyone in Kalal Yisrael for their share that they do. Tonight we've come to talk about a very important topic. All of us know that we are counting the days of Svirat Omer. I hope Mr. Goldberg and Mr. Herbstman will excuse my Sephardic accent tonight, okay? All the Ashkenazis will please bear with me. So tonight, as we have been doing for the previous days until Shavuot, we are counting the days. But the topic tonight is not only to count the days, but to make every day count. And that's the most important thing that we can do in life. And I will show you something very interesting, a beautiful story that brings out this thought. The second Ger Rebbe was known as this Sfas Emes. And he died, he was 58 years old. Now when he died at his funeral, the next Rebbe, the Imre Emes, said to his brother, Rabbi Tzalel, he said, you know, at least our father had arichas yomim. The simple meaning of arichas yomim means he had long days. He lived a long time. So his brother, Rabbi Talal, said, what are you talking about? He didn't have arichas yomim. He only lived till he's 58. That's not a long life. He said, you didn't hear what I said. I didn't say that he had arichas shonim, length of years. I said he had arichas yomim length of days, and that's a great difference. No one, no one in the world, no rabbi, no doctor, no one can guarantee for anyone Arich Hashanim, length of years. Nobody knows what happens tomorrow. Nobody knows how long they could live, 40, 50, 60, 70, nobody knows. But every single one of us in this base Medrash tonight can guarantee for ourselves Arich Hashanim length of days. That's what the Rebbe was saying about his father. At least his father had length of days. That means he made the most out of every day. And that's all that Hashem could want from us. Hashem cannot demand from us Arich Hashanim. That's up to him. How long, how many years, long years that a person has. But every single one of us, and we will learn tonight how, to make sure that every day counts. And so no matter how long a person lives, whether it's 40, 50, 60, 70, he can have a richas yamin. It's really up to every single one of us. So I want to ask you a question. And this question is a question that many commentaries ask about. And there are two different answers from two different spectrums. And you will see something interesting. Why, when we begin to count Safirat Omer, don't we say Shekhiyano? Every time we have a mitzvah that we don't do for a long time, 
We say Shechayano. When we sit in the Sukkah, when we shake the Lulav, when we eat Matzah, we read the Megillah, Shofar, all these things that happen once in a while, we say Shechayano. So Sefirat Omer is once a year that we begin counting for the 49 days. Why don't we say Shechayano? So one answer is very, very interesting. And that is the Ran. The Ran is in the back of the Masechtas. He was one of the Rishonim. He lived in the time of the Rif and Rambam and Rashi. And he says something very interesting. He says, you know, the only time you say Shechayano on a mitzvah is when it brings you great joy. Who doesn't enjoy Hanukkah? Who doesn't enjoy Sukkot? or sitting at a Seder and eating matzah, it's pleasurable. But if you think about the words that you are saying when you count the sefirah, really, there should be a tinge of sadness. We say, Asher al omer. We're counting the omer. But if a person is thinking, hey, wait a second, we don't have the korban omer today. We don't have the Beis HaMikdash. We're making a blessing as if we're counting the sefirah, as if we're going to bring the Korban Omer. But we're not bringing it because we don't have the Beis HaMikdash. So in a sense, that could bring us a tinge of sadness. That's why we don't say Shechiano. Now, when I saw this, I thought of something, and maybe you'll agree with me. What are the very first words we say after you count sefirah to Omer? Who knows? Harachaman, what do we say? Why do we say that? Where does that come from? You know what I think? Because we just said Sefirat Omer. And we're thinking that we're sad because we don't have the Beis HaMikdash. So what do we say? The first words, Harachaman, the compassionate one. Bring back the Beis HaMikdash. That's why I think it's there. Because if you think about what you're saying, it might bring sadness. But then we pray right away, Hashem, please return the Beit HaMikdash right away. So that's one answer. The Bnei Yisachar was a great Hasidic Rebbe. And he said a totally different answer on why we do not say Shechiyano. Listen to what he said. Ki ain't <coughs> hachuka. Our desire is not on the days that we're counting. We're counting until we reach Shavuot. When we count, that's just the hachana, that's just the beginning, the preparation, till we get to the main day, then we say Shechiano. The main part of the mitzvah is not only the counting, but what we're going to reach on that high level. And that's when we count Shechiano. That's when we say Shechiano because we're climbing higher and higher. And you know something? His answer gives us an answer for another question. Let's say I told you, that you won a lottery, you didn't hear about it, but I was parking and I heard that you won a lottery of $10 million and you were gonna get it in 49 days. How would you count? 48, 47, 46, wow, 20, 19, 18, two, I get that lottery, right? So if that's the case, for Shavuot, why don't we count the same way? <coughs> we're waiting for Shavuot, so we should say 49 days, 48, 47, 46, Right? When you're excited about something, you count down. Why are we counting up? Oh, the answer is because we're counting up because every day we're supposed to get higher. It's not just that we're waiting for Shavuot like winning a lottery. Because then we would count backwards all the way down. But every day we're supposed to climb higher and higher and higher. And we get to 49 levels. Then we come to Shavuot. And then we're able to say Shechiano. So now we have two different answers. One, because it brought us some pain. That's why we don't say Sheikh Yano. And the other is because we're preparing to get higher. What are we preparing for? Watch this. You'll see something again from the Bnei Yisachar that's genius. He tells us that in the Mishnah in Avot, in Perik Beis in the second chapter, it tells Rabbi Yochanan Mazakai was sitting with a group of Talmidim. And he said to the Talmidim, he said, tell me, what do you think is the best midah? What do you think is the best character trait that every Jew should have? So one said, you know, everybody should have an eye in toy, a good eye. You know what that means? Some people have more money than you. Some people have a nicer car than you. Some people have a nicer house than you. Don't be jealous. 
Be happy. Have a good eye. Be happy for other people. Another one said, everybody should strive to be a haver tov, a good friend. You know, many of us have acquaintances. How many have a good friend? A good friend that you haven't seen him and then you just start right where you left off six months ago, a year ago. It makes no difference, right? So everybody should have a haver tov. Finally, Rabbi Lezeb ben Aruch said, Rebbe, you know what I think? I think every Jew should have a leif tov, a good heart. Rabbi Yechon Bazakai says, oh my, that's amazing. He says, that which you said about the Lev Tov, that is the right answer. You know why? Because if everybody has a Lev Tov, then he's going to have all these things. He's going to have a good eye. He'll be a good neighbor. He'll be a good friend. Fine. Lev Tov, very nice, right? Simple Mishnah. Question is, what should we all have? And he says, we should have a Lev Tov. Now watch what the... the the Rebbe says, the Bnei Yisrael says something genius. I know many people over here, you certainly know that every letter is worth a certain amount, right? How much does the word lave equal? 32, right? Lamed and base. How much does the word toiv equal? 17. How much is 32 and 17? 49. Oh, now he says, now I understand. Why did Hashem make it that we have 49 days in the Omer? What's wrong with 39, 59, 29? Where did 49 come from? You know why? Because 49 is Lev Tov. That's what we're striving for. To get a good heart. And isn't it interesting? After the 32 days of Lev, what's the next day after that? Lag Bomer. Right? That's, that's when the Tov begins. That's when the days of Tov begin. After the first 32 days. Then is the last 17 days of Tov, and it starts with Lag Bomer. Oh, if that's the case, now we know there's a famous expression, Derech Eretz, Kodmala Torah. Derech Eretz, character traits, respect, kindness, dignity. That's the Leif Tov. That's why we have the Leif Tov. 49 days, 32 and 17 before Shavuot. So we should have Derech Eretz. We're going for the Torah, right? We're going to get the Torah at Shavuot. So that's why we have the, the 49 days. That's what Lev Tov is all about. And if that's the case, so now we understand something absolutely incredible. That there is a time of preparation. And we are supposed to go from the holiday of Pesach to the holiday of Shavuos, every day climbing higher and higher in having a good heart. Now, I want to tell you something that you really have to fasten your seatbelts for this. Because when you see this in a Rashi, which I'm going to show you in a moment, I hope you all have a Chumash, otherwise I'll quote it for you. Have a Chumash, Parshas Vayeshev. You will absolutely not believe this. Rabbeinu Manoach. Rabbeinu Manoach was one of the Rishonim he also lived in the time of the Ran, the Rambam, Rashi, those people. He says the most incredible thing. He says, why do we dip at the Seder? We dip karpas in salt water. Some say karpas is a potato. Some say it's romaine lettuce. Everybody has different things. Why do we dip it? If you thought about it for 500 years, you wouldn't come up with his answer. You know what he says? Because the brothers dipped the coat in blood. Do you remember that story, right? The brothers sold them, and then they wanted to fool their father and say that Yosef was killed. So what did they do? They killed an animal, and then they dipped this coat, the Xenus Pasim, the beautiful coat that the father gave, and they dipped it in blood. That's why we dip it at the Seder. What does that mean? What's the connection? And he says something brilliant. He says, we come to the Seder. A whole night we're going to talk about Yitziat Mitzrayim, how we got out of Mitzrayim. But the Bala God that wants to say, wait guys, before you talk of how you got out, let's, how'd you get in? How'd you get in there? You know how you got in? Because the brothers couldn't get along. Because there was fighting among brothers. That's why we dipped the Ksonas Pasim at the start of the Seder, before Manishtana, before Halachma, before Afikom, before anything. The Balagada wants to say, Rabotai, remember how you got in before you talk about how you got out. You got in because brothers couldn't get along. Now, let's watch. So we do the Seder, and then we do the Sefirah, 
And what happened at Har Sinai? The Pasuk tells us, Vayichan Shom Yisrael. Klal Yisrael rested there. What does Chazal teach us? Somebody tell me. Ki ish echad, belev echad. Oh, they were like one. So now they started at the Seder talking about the Ksones Pasim, the argument that the brothers couldn't get along. But throughout the Shavuot, we go higher and higher and higher until we reach the level that we're like one heart. That's what it's all about. <laughs> that's why we have 49 days, and that's why we start with the Karpas. That shows us the arguments of Klal Yisrael. Now, how many people just happen to have a Chumash in front of them? Anybody have a Chumash Boratius in front of you? You have a Chumash? Okay, just take a look for a second. You won't believe what I'm about to show you. And then we'll get a young man to come up here and he'll read the Rashi for us. You guys will faint, Mamish. Come here, Tzadik. You got a Chumash? Okay. Let's get this boy a Chumash up here. Huh? You got a Chumash with Rashi? There we go. Here, take a look over there. Take that Chumash with Rashi, okay? And you come up here, Tzadik. You're going to be on tour anytime that come tomorrow night. They'll see you in Australia. Come here. Okay, make you famous. I'll get the best Shidduch in the world. Okay. Now, we're going to turn to Parshas Vayeshev. And in Parshas Vayeshev, what's your name? Yaakov. Yaakov. Okay, it's like a contestant in a game show or something. Okay. Now, read this out loud. Also, lo, what did Yaakov make for his son? Ketonet Pasim. Ketonet Pasim, right? He made for him a Ketonet Pasim. Those of you who have a Chumash, take a look. Perik Lam Zayin Gimel. Okay, now, I want you to read out loud. Pasim, Rashi is telling us. What does it mean? Loshon. Klei Milas, which is like wool. Kimo Karpas. Hey, what did you just say? Karpas. Karpas. That's amazing. That's amazing, right? Rashi is telling us in Chumash, this Rashi has existed Right? Thousand years? Who ever thought about that? That the Ksones Pasim that Rashi says is Karpas. That's amazing. Rabbi Isaac Bernstein realized this and he brought this out in a shiur. That's amazing. So now, all of a sudden, again, take a look at Perik Lamet Zion, Posse Gimel, on the word Ksones Pasim. Rashi says Karpas. Thank you. You should bring peace to Klau Yisrael. Here you are. Amen. And if you should have come from Australia, remember, I get a cut. <laughs> but the idea is, the idea is now we see what Sonas Possum is. That was Karpas. And that's what we try to do to get that leaf to So how are we going to do it? I'll tell you how to do it. I'll tell you something that we can start doing from tonight on. Every single one of you should have a little notebook. And every day, write down one chesed that you do for another Jew. Not a husband for a wife or a wife for a husband. That you got to do if you know what's good for you. I'm talking out of the house. You made a call to somebody. You took somebody in a carpool. You made a loan. You made a call. Somebody should be able to get a job. Whatever you do, every day there's a way that you can do chesed. And I guarantee you, you do that for two months and you don't miss a day, your life will change. You know how I know? Because the Pasuk tells us, Hashem Tzilcho, God is your shadow. You do for others, others will do for you. And you'll be amazed how your life will change and become better. Because Hashem does for you what you do to others. And you don't have to write down 10 chasadim, even if you do 10 chasadim. Do it once. Just one, I write down one. Even if you do 10, that's great, but just write down one. My dream, my dream is one day to have an app on an iPhone, chesed a day or whatever. I need somebody to do that. I don't know how to do that. But I, I can tell you, I've seen many, many people, they have this spiral and they have on it chesed a day and they do not go to sleep until they've done a chesed for somebody else. And that's a way to achieve achdus because what happens is that as you're getting to 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon, you begin to think, oh my gosh, I didn't do anything for another Jew today. You know, I just did my business. I went around, I did my business. You know, that's fine. But if you do something for somebody else, you feel good about yourself. And you cause ardut, you cause unity. You know why? Because then that person is going to be inspired and that person will do for others. So let us make, maybe that could be a project for Chazak. 
that we should have these notebooks. Everybody should be able to get one. And every day, just write down one chesed that you did for somebody else, and that will be a tremendous tikkun. Maybe we could call it the Lev Tov Chesed book. You know, Lev Tov, 49. And that's what we learned, you know, as we got towards Shavuot. And that would be one way that we should get up to doing a chesed. So I want to tell you two stories about chesed. Amazing stories. And they're amazing because one has to do with children and the other has to do with adults. And this story happened this past summer. There is a camp, the name of the camp, it's in Monticello, it's Camp Romamu. And my son-in-law, Rabbi Shlomo David Pfeiffer, and another man, Rabbi Ivrami Dale, they were the learning counselors of the camp, learning directors. And you know, I don't know if any of you have ever been to a boys' camp, but on Shabbat, it's very hard to run a boys' camp. What are you gonna do with the kids a whole day? They can't go swimming, they don't go playing football, soccer, you know, what are they gonna do? So what they did was they decided, listen guys, we will give you a raffle for every half hour that you learn Torah. So if you learn an hour, you get two raffles. You learn two hours, you get four raffles. And we're gonna give two prizes. In the middle of the summer, one, one, you know, one set of two prizes. At the end of the summer, another set of two prizes. What are gonna be the two prizes? One prize was, you know, in many of the camps, the head counselor has like a golf cart. And he drives it all around, you know, and all the kids want to get on it. So you could drive the golf cart for an hour. Go all around the camp and take whoever you want on it, you know, two, three guys. It would be fun. A lot of kids were excited about that, but he was the second prize. And there were kids this year from Antwerp in Belgium. And they were very excited about the second prize. The second prize was an hour or two of horseback riding. And one of these kids from Antwerp, he jumped up, oh, I want to win that prize. Everybody started laughing. It's 400 kids in a camp. How's he going to win that prize? Well, because he wants to win the prize. So they figured, okay, he's going to put in a lot of hours of learning. And he did. And you know what happened? You would never believe it. The night when they picked out the winning raffle, this kid won. Nobody could believe it. How could that kid from Antwerp win just because he said he wanted to win? And then after the raffle was chosen, the head counselor, Rabbi Shlomo Pfeiffer, said, boys, I want to tell you a secret. First of all, he said, I want you to know I'm so proud of how many hours all of you learned every Shabbat. And there were hundreds and hundreds of raffles. But I want to tell you something. He said, you know, this boy in this bunk, 10-year-old boy, fifth graders, you know what the kids in his bunk did? You wouldn't believe. They learned many hours every Shabbat, and on every raffle they put his name. 10-year-old kids. And you know what I can't believe? I can't believe that 10-year-old kids could keep a secret. <laughs> could you imagine? Imagine, I've got a 10-year-old. Hey, how old are you? Nine. Could you keep a secret? <laughs> yeah, he doesn't want to say it, right? How are you going to get a shidduch in Australia? Okay. But anyway, but the idea is, how can 10 year olds keep a secret? But each one of the kids, they learned for hours. And Motzah Shabbos, when the head counselor said, okay, give me your name, they put his name. Of course, by the time they drew out the raffle, he had 160 raffles. Of course he's going to win. But that's greatness. That's greatness of little children. Look how little children did something so beautiful for the sake of a child who will never, ever forget it. That's Ahdut. That's unity. Now I want to tell you another story. It's a little painful and embarrassing to tell you about this story because it has to do with me and my family, but I still think it'll bring out a very, very special lesson. Some of you who know me personally and know me for many years know that when I was 21, my father died. My father died, he was only 47. Now, when you're 21, you think 47 is an old man. But all of us here beyond 47 know how, 40, how young 47 really is. I'm the oldest of seven children, and at that time, my father was a Mohel. He was a Long Island Jewish hospital. Long Island Jewish had started just around that time. My father was the first Mohel there with others. And he taught me how to do Brit Milah, but believe me, when you're a 21-year-old kid, not many people want to take you as a mohel. I would walk into a house, and a grandmother would take a look at me and say, oh, you look so young. I would say, well, the baby's also young. <laughs> right? So you try to break the ice, right? So I want to tell you something that it took me more than 20 years to say in public. 
Because I was so humiliated about this thing that I'm going to tell you right now. I couldn't even talk about it, but now I guess I could laugh at it. Do you know that a guy actually sent me home once? I came in with my brisk bag. I was so young. He took one look at me. He said, you are not going to touch my son. Could you believe the humiliation? I had to go home and tell my mother. She said, how'd you get home so fast? It's awful. Awful. So besides, you know, that it was hard, you know, to get people to trust me, you know, at that age. But when this guy sent me home, you know, that was the worst. But okay, Baruch Hashem, I'm still here to talk about it. But anyway, let me just tell you what happened. One day I come to the synagogue, I'm dancing in my shul in Kew Gardens. I'm not the rabbi there, I'm like anybody else. And a man, Mr. Israel, comes over to me. And he says, Pesach, you know, I know it's not easy for you, I have something for you. And he gives me an envelope. It's 1967, my father died in 1966. And he gives me an envelope with $1,500. Now, $1,500 is a lot of money today. In 67, it certainly was a lot of money. I was so taken aback. I said, Mr. Israel, thank you, but, you know, we're not poor. We don't need tzedakah. He said, no, this is not tzedakah. This is a loan. I said, when do I have to pay it back? He said, I will never ask you for it, never. Whatever you want, you pay me back. I said, you know, thank you very much. I'm going to go home now from shul, and I'm going to talk to my mother. And if she wants to take it, I will. But if not, I'm not going to take it. I go home. I say, Ma, Mr. Israel just gave us $1,500. She said, wait a second. We're not poor. We don't need tzedakah. Ma, I said the same thing to him. But he said it's a loan. So when do we pay back? Whatever we want. He'll never ask. OK. We really did need the money, so I took it. Fine. Two years later, I was 23 already, and more and more people were taking me. I put back, I put together the money, and I went to his office on Queens Boulevard. And I come to his office, I said, Mr. Israel, I want to thank you very much for what you did. We really did need the money then, so here's the 1500 back. He says, I'm not taking it. I said, what are you talking about you're not taking it? You said it was a loan. We weren't going to take tzedakah. Huh? He says, sit down, I want to tell you a story. He says, do you remember a couple years ago when I went bankrupt? He's talking about himself. Oh my gosh, did I remember. The whole synagogue was shocked because he was such a wealthy man and all of a sudden he went bankrupt. He said, you know, a man in our neighborhood, Mr. Lewinstein, he came over to me and he gave me money. And I said to him, I, I'm not poor, I don't need tzedakah. He said, no, it's not tzedakah, it's a loan. So I said to him what you said to me. When do I pay back? He said, I'll never ask you whenever you want. A few years later, I came back to pay Mr. Lowenstein, and he said, I'm not taking the money. So I said, what do you mean you're not taking the money? You said it's a loan. He said, of course it's a loan. And you gotta pay, but not me. One day you're gonna find a family that needs the money, and you give it to them. That's how you pay me back. And when they come to pay you, you're gonna tell them the same thing. You're not taking the money, but they should pass it on to somebody else. And that's exactly what my mother and I did. A few months later, we knew a family that needed the money, we gave it to them, and when they came to pay us back, we told them, pass it on to somebody else. That's unity, that's chesed, that's a community that's together. That's what chesed is all about. And sometimes you have to be creative, like Mr. Israel was, or Mr. Lowenstein really, because that was his original idea. But when you have people that are doing that, then you know you have a leif toiv. Then you know that you're climbing the ladder towards shivuot, that ki'ish echod, b'leiv echod, that's what they're all about. I want to talk now about a totally different topic. But it has to do with sefira, and it's not easy to listen to because I'm sure that most of you never thought about this idea. But we are going to see something amazing in a moment. We all know one of the saddest gemarot that tells us that Rabbi Akiva had, how many tell me did? 24,000. And they all died. Why? Because they didn't give honor one to the other. Now, we know that they died within a period of 33 days. The machloket is which 33 days? From the second day of Pesach until Lagbomer, or from Rosh Chodesh till Shavuos? Did you ever do the math? If he lost, 24,000 Talmidim in 33 days. How many died every day on the average? 
Who said 700? They, they're right. That's what the answer is about that. What? 759. Well, you're close. It's 737. 737. Could you ima- imagine that you are Rabbi Akiva? Think about it for a second. You're the teacher in a big base medrash. And 737 guys are dying every day, right? So they call Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi, come to your shalayim, give a eulogy, give a husband. This young guy with two kids, he was your top, and he just died. Come to his funeral. Rabbi Akiva comes, he cries, and then they, by the time he finishes, go to Bnei Brak. In Bnei Brak, that was a Ben Yachid, he was the only child in the family, he just died. Please, give a husband. He finishes there, Rabbi, you gotta come to Haifa. That guy who's a Chatan, he just became a Chatan, he just died. Rabbi, please, give a husband. And he's going from Haifa to Ashkelon to Ashdod, Kfar Saba, he doesn't stop. Every day. What if we were Rabbi Akiva? What if you were Rabbi Akiva? What would you say? Okay, God, I understand you don't like me. I'm out of here. Get a different teacher of Torah. Forget it. Obviously, you don't like me. Obviously, I did something terrible. I'm out of here. That's not what Rabbi Akiva does. You know what he does? He said, okay, God, I understand. I understand. I made a mistake. We made a mistake. We're going to start over. And this time, we're going to do it right. And he gets five Talmudim. And listen to what he says. Let us give and pay attention. We are not going to do what they did. We will be careful to give honor to each other. These five, they taught other five who taught other five, and they brought Torah to the whole Eretz Yisrael. Isn't that amazing? What a lesson. You know what the lesson is? You never get broken. Sometimes the worst things seem to be happening. But you don't get broken. Rabbi Akiva, the Yomara, tells us the last daf in Makas. You can take a look at it. The last daf in Makos tells us that he was once walking with other Talmidim near the spot where the Beis Amigdash was. And a fox came out where the Kohen used to do the work. And all the Chachamim, they started crying. They said, why are you crying? He said, you know this place is so holy that a regular Jew was not able to go there, only the Kohen, the Kohen Gadol would go there. And now a fox is walking there, that's not sad. And Rabbi Akiva's laughing. They said, Rabbi Akiva, how could you be laughing? It's so sad. He said, you know what, the Navi predicted that this was gonna happen. But the Navi predicted that the Gula and good things are going to happen. So now that I see that the bad stuff came true, so the good stuff is surely going to come true. That's why I'm laughing. Whoa, that's a different attitude. A person could be broken by certain things that go on in his family, in his business, in his finances, in his health. But in these days of the Sefirah, we have to learn the lesson, we have to learn the lesson of Rabbi Akiva. Don't get broken. Rabbi Akiva could have thrown in the towel. Rabbi Akiva could have said, Hashem, I'm out of here. Obviously, you don't like me. But he started all over again, and he was able to build Torah all over Eretz Yisrael. That's what Rabbi Akiva is teaching us. The lesson of being positive. I want to tell you something adorable. You know, we're talking very serious. Let's talk something light, but the same idea about never getting broken. I have a friend, his name is Yitzchak Saflis. He has an advertising company. It's called Bottom Line Management. And he recently had fundraisers from many, many different organizations coming to talk about their problems in fundraising. You know, every profession, whether you're in advertising or you're selling diamonds or in real estate or doctors, lawyers, you know, everybody, every situation has its occupational hazards. So these guys got together and they were talking about, you know, fundraising, how it's not always easy. And one guy said, let me tell you what the answer to fundraising is all about. And he holds up this sign. I hope everybody can see it. SW to the third power slash N. Nobody knew what he's talking about. SW to the third power slash N. And when I heard what he had to say, you know something? I realized this is what life is all about. You know what he said fundraising is? Some will, some won't. So what? Next. (laughs) That's a great lesson. Some will, some won't. So what? Next. 
I recently had to speak for 120 divorced men and women. Not from each other, they wouldn't be in the same room, right? But I had to speak, you know, to the, you know what I said to them? Hey, don't be worried, some marriages will work out, some won't work out, so what, next? And that's what life is all about. That's what life is all about, that's what Rabbi Akiva is all about. Some things will work out, you're trying to get a job, right? You call the guy, he won't give you the interview, so what? Some will give you the interview, some won't give you the interview. So I could go next. A Jew does not get broken. That's the lesson of Rabbi Akiva. That's the lesson of positive thinking. That's the lesson of seeing the fox in the base of Migdash, and you're not crying, you're laughing. Because if the Chachamim, the Nevi'im, they said what's bad, and they, that they predicted that the bad will come, so when they predict that the good will come, that's the same thing too. So Mr. Harari in your pizza shop, you can hang it up. Some will like the pizza, some will not like the pizza. So what next, right? You gotta get a falafel, right? Don't, don't, don't be afraid, right? You gotta hang that up in Shimon's pizza, right? Okay, but anyway, but this is a great lesson in life. And this is a great lesson that shows us never to give up. I wanna share with you now another thing. You know, we're talking about making every day count. And we're talking about long days, Arich Yamin. There's an amazing Gemara. You have to see the Gemara inside to really appreciate it. The Gemara is in Megillah, Chav Zayin, Amad Bey's 27B in your art scroll Gemara. And the Gemara tells us like this. The Gemara asks a question. The Gemara asks many Tamir Chachamim, many Amoraim, Bama Harachta Yamim. How did you live long? Now, many of these people lived very long. And so they asked each one the question How did you live long? What did you do that Hashem blessed you that you should live long? Wouldn't we all want to know the answer to that question? What did they do that Hashem blessed them? Now, you're going to hear the answer. But it's not going to come right away. I just want to develop something. 28 different answers in the Gemara. So here are some of them. Obviously, we're not going to go through all of them. One of them, he said, I never made a shortcut in the base of Medrash. In other words, if I had to go from 70, 172nd Street to 171st, I didn't walk through the shul to make a shortcut. I walked around. That's what one of them said. Another one said, no one ever came to the synagogue before me. I was the first one to come every day. Another one said, I never got angry in my house. Whoa, that's a good one, right? Let me repeat that for some of you guys. I never got angry in my house. Okay? Very important lesson. And here's another one. I was never happy when my friend got embarrassed. And it goes on and on and on and on. So now, Dinitziv, Rab Naftoli, Tzvi, Yehuda, Berlin, asks a question. What if you want to live long? What are you supposed to do? Can't do all 28 things, right? Nobody can do everything. What are you supposed to do? What is the answer here? And then he says an amazing thing. And then Rabbi Yudha HaChosid kind of brings the whole thing together. He said, <coughs> each one of them said the same first word. One person said, Miyomai, all my days, I never made a shortcut in the synagogue. The other one said, all my days, miyomai, nobody ever came to the Beis Medrash before me. Another one said, miyomai, all my days, I never got angry at home. The other one said, miyomai, all my days, I was never happy if my friend got embarrassed. And that's what he says the answer is. No matter what you do, but if you do it every day consistently, then you're going to live long. And it doesn't have any to be something from the Torah. Let me read to you what Rabbi Yehuda HaChosid says. Rabbi Yehuda HaChosid says, Imro Iso Tamit Chacham. You see a big Tamit Chacham that he's living long. Know that he added something to his life that not everybody does. And it doesn't even have to be something from the Torah. Because not one of these things say in the Torah. It doesn't say in the Torah, you're not allowed to make a shortcut through a shul. It doesn't say in the Torah you got to be the first one to come to the synagogue. It doesn't say in the Torah you're not supposed to be happy when your friend gets embarrassed. But if you do something and you do it every single day consistently, then Hashem says, 
I'm going to give you long days. Now, I don't know if you know of this man. He just passed away recently. His name was Rabbi Scheinberg. Did anybody ever hear of Rabbi Scheinberg from Torah Or? Right? In Israel. What mitzvah did he do more than anybody else? Tzitzit, right? He wore all those pairs and pairs and pairs and pairs of tzitzit. Now, I remember they asked me I should come to speak at his 100th birthday. They had a big dinner and all the Talmudim came and it was like a dinner in the yeshiva's honor and they asked me to speak. And this is what I spoke about. I said, how did he get to live to be 100 years old? You know why? I think. Because he did a mitzvah. Not that it says in the Torah. It doesn't say in the Torah you have to have 80 pairs of tzitzis. Because if it would have said that Rabbi Yasha would do it, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein would do it, everybody would do it. Every time did. Rabbi Shlomo Zalman, Rabbi Vadi Yosef, they didn't do it. But he undertook a mitzvah and he did it every single day without stop for 80 years. Oh, you want to take something? And you never miss a day, like we said before, a chesed every day? Oh, then you're going to be blessed that every day will count, and then you're going to have arichat yamim. So what could we undertake? Everybody has to think. There is something good that I could do every day. It doesn't have to be only a doraisa. Let's say every day a person decides from tonight on, or tomorrow morning on, I am going to say three parakim. Of Tehillim. I will never miss, no matter where I am, every day I'm going to say three chapters of Tehillim. And from now on, you never miss it. That's me, oh my. That's the blessing. If let's say a person says, you know what? From now on, every time I come to the synagogue, I'm going to put away the Sudurim. There are a lot of Sudurim, you know, people, you know, Davin, and they leave the sitter. And the show gets a little messy. Somebody's got to clean it up. But what happens if you say, you know something? Every day, I'm going to put away 10 sudurim. You don't have to put away all of them, but if you put away all of them, that's great. But never a day misses that you don't do that. Or maybe you say, every day, I'm going to call a lonely lady. I'm going to call my grandmother. I'm going to call my aunt. You know, this is for women to do, right? Because you're not in the shul. You can't put away the sudurim. But we all know the lonely people who couldn't get out. It might be in a wheelchair, it might be in a nursing home. Keep a notebook. Every day, call another person, say, hi, I was thinking about you. They'll probably faint. They won't believe it. You're thinking about me? Nobody ever calls me. Except when they need money or they think I'm going to die and they want my money, you know. But otherwise, whoever calls these people. But imagine you go and every day you call a lonely person. What a beautiful mitzvah. It doesn't say in the Torah you have to call a lonely person. But if you do that, me, oh my, every day. That's what Rabbi Huda Chassid is telling us. That's how you're going to make every day count. And that's how a person is going to be zochah to have arichas yamim. Again, there's no guarantee for arichas shonim for length of years. Nobody can guarantee, no matter what you do. But every one of us can have arichas yamim. I want to tell you one more story, <clears throat> then we'll review and we'll end with an unbelievable story that will change you forever. But let me tell you first this story. You know, in the early 1900s, there was a big tzaddik that came from Europe. His name was Rabbi Yaakov David Wilofsky. He was called the Ridvaz. He wrote a commentary on the Yerushalmi and he came to New York to give chizuk to many people here. And he spoke in the Lower East Side. There's a very big synagogue in the Lower East Side. It's called the Pike Street Synagogue. Today, unfortunately, the Chinese have it. But in its heyday, that was the main synagogue. I remember when I was a teenager, Rabbi Aaron Cutler passed away. That's where they had the funeral, at the Pike Street Synagogue. I couldn't even get in. It was packed. Thousands and thousands of people, inside, outside, all over. So listen to what he said. He said, you know, in generations gone by, there were generations that those Jews were called mitzvah Jews. What does it mean, mitzvah Jews? He said, these people were not Tamir Chachamim. They didn't learn Torah, but they loved mitzvot. For example, they loved Shabbat. They would never do anything to violate the Shabbat. And whatever the rabbi told them you're supposed to do on Shabbat, that's what they did. And they gave it over to their children, that love for Shabbat. So they were called mitzvah Jews. There were other people 
that love the mitzvah, let's say, of tefillah. They never missed the minyan, always prayed every word out loud, and they gave over that love for the mitzvah of tefillah to their next generation. They were those who loved kashrut. They were so careful. They wouldn't eat anything unless they knew it was a thousand percent kosher. And they gave over that to their children. But they didn't learn Torah. They didn't know how to learn Torah. But you know what happened? With these Jews, he said, all of a sudden when the Goyesh influence came, the secular influence, the influence of secularism and immorality and all the modern things, it ended. The Yiddishkeit ended. The Judaism ended. You know why? He said a fabulous pasuk that we all know. Kiner mitzvah. The mitzvah is only a candle. Right now, if we had a candle that was lit here, the windows are closed, the doors, there's no wind blowing in, so the candle could go forever. But as soon as the wind comes in, or oh, blows out the candle. That's what he said. When the winds of secularism and materialism come... It blows away those who only do mitzvot. But what about Torah? Kiner mitzvah the Torah or. Torah is a blazing flame. You ever see these pictures of the fires that are burning in California, the acres of land on fire? What happens when a big wind comes? The wind comes and it sweeps the fire and the fire gets stronger. He says if somebody learns Torah and then he's confronted by those winds, the winds make him stronger. And that's what he said. It's not enough to do mitzvot. Of course mitzvot are important. But if you want to be able to be a strong Jew, that's not going to be influenced by the outside, every one of us has to be able to learn Torah. Every one of us has to teach Torah to our children. That's the hachana. That's the getting ready for Shavuot. Having, learning Torah. Because Torah is a flame. But mitzvot, as much as they are important, are only a candle. Kiner mitzvah the Torah or. So as we prepare, and as we spoke about being a leif toiv, derech eretz, kodmala Torah, every one of us must study Torah every single day. Whether it's Mishnayis, whether it's Halacha, whether it's Gemara, no day should go by, and that's what the Chavetz Chaim tells us. Every day you've got to do at least one chesed and learn one bit of Torah. Oh, then your day counts. You've got to sleep, are you thinking on a pillow, what I do today? I did a chesed. I learned Torah. I didn't waste my day. My day is worth something. In Shemayim, they're writing down, I did something with my day. I not only counted the days, I made my days count. That's what it's about. Kinei mitzvah, the Torah or. So let's review everything that we said, and then we'll end with a great story. Let's remember this Vas Emes died at 58. And his son, the Imre Emma, said, at least our father had Arichas Yomim. His brother asked, what do you mean Arichas Yomim? He only lived 58. He said, I didn't say Arichas Shonim. Length of years, nobody can guarantee that. But every one of us can guarantee Arichas Yomim. Length of days, making every day count. The Ran taught us we don't say Shechiano because it brings sadness. Because we think of Sefirah, the Beis Amigdash, that we don't have. That's why we say, Harachaman hu Yahzilano, Savoras Beis Amigdash, because we pray for the Beis Amigdash. The Bnei Yisoscha taught us we're counting up. That's why we don't count down, because we're trying to reach Shavuot. How are we counting 49 days? Lev Tov. Lev is 32. Tov is 17. 32 and 17 is 49. Derech Eretz, Kodma la Torah. How are we going to do that? By doing a chesed every single day. That's how we develop our good Lev Tov. That's how we develop the Achdut. The Seder started with Karpas. As this Tzadik showed us, the Ksonas Pasim Rashi says it's Karpas. Because brothers couldn't get along. That's how the goal has started. We go all the way to Shavuot. Vayichan Sham Yisrael. Ke'ish Echod. Belev Echod. Let's remember that story of in camp where the little boys put their name on the raffle. Let's remember the story where Mr. Israel gave me the money, but only that I should pass it on to somebody else. Let's remember Rabbi Akiva didn't give up. 737 average on the day he lost. Did he throw in the towel and say, okay, God, I'm out of here? No. We made a mistake, we're going to correct it. And then he filled the whole Eretz Yisrael of Torah. He saw the fox in the base of Midrash. He didn't cry, he laughed. He said, because if the bad came true, the good is also going to come true. And as we said, SW to the third power slash N. Some will, some won't. So what? 
And this is for guys that are going out and girls that are going out. You know, sometimes the guy's going out and the girl doesn't want him and he thinks, oh my gosh, if she doesn't want me, I'm finished. My life is over. Some will go out with you and some won't marry you. So what? Next. <coughs> and same thing with the girls. If this guy doesn't want you, so what? There's somebody else. Don't be broken. There's somebody out there for everybody. Be'ezrat Hashem. And finally, we spoke about miyomai. Doing something every day. Just like Rav Scheinberg put on tzitzit. Just like that person who didn't make a shortcut. He wasn't, another person wasn't happy when somebody else got embarrassed. He, he was never the second one in the show, always the first one. But miyomai, always, consistent. Think about it tonight before you go to sleep. What can I undertake in my life? A good thing that I will do from now on every single day and write it down. Bezerat Hashem will all have Arvichat Yamin. I just want to end with this story. Many of you know that I have the opportunity to travel in many places throughout the Jewish world. As I told you just last week, I was in Australia, a couple weeks before in England, a couple weeks before that in Mexico. I love to travel. I love to see good Jews. There are great Jews all over the world. Beautiful. Best people in the world. And you know, when I go to these places, I never stay in a hotel. Never. Almost never. Because I want to be with the people. I want to learn about the people. I want to mingle with the people. I want to see good Jewish people all over the place. But one of the greatest places, if you've never been there, is South Africa. You've got to go to South Africa. It's unbelievable. I remember the first time that I, once, that I went to, I was going to South Africa. I met Rabbi Wine. He said, you're going to Gan Eden. And I'm telling you, you go down to Cape Town. And Cape, at the Cape Point, where the Atlantic Ocean meets the Indian Ocean, there's nothing that's so breathtaking as that. You just want to make the bracha by itself. It just flies out of your mouth. It's so stunningly beautiful. But you know what's even nicer in South Africa? The Jews. So many balei tshuva, you cannot believe thousands and thousands. And they have a great chief rabbi, a young guy. His name is Rabbi Warren Goldstein. I don't know if you know. But did you read a few months ago, he had all the Jews, come on, 20,000 Jews in South Africa. They all kept one Shabbat. Now he's trying to do it all around the world this coming February. They had 2,000 women in the street baking challah. The streets were closed. The lights were on. It was the most amazing thing. So he called me up. You look it up, Rabbi Warren Goldstein. He did it this past Parshish Lech Lecha. Amazing. He calls me up. He says, Rabbi Krohn, we have what's called Sinai and Daba. And Daba is a South African Zulu word, which means conference for important things. We're going to have speakers, eight speakers, come from all over the world. And we're going to get all the Jews together. We're going to get 4,000 Jews in a Johannesburg hotel. I want you to be one of the speakers, you and others. And that'll be Saturday night. Then Sunday night, the other four speakers will speak. And Sunday, every day, there'll be sessions. Different sessions that all the speakers will give to all the people that will come. I said, that's wonderful. I'll be honored to come. He said, but I want to tell you one thing I need you to do me a favor. Besides your speaking, Rabbi Beryl Wine is coming. Anybody, everybody here heard of Rabbi Beryl Wine? Who heard of Bar Beryl Wine, right? Everybody knows Rabbi Wine, right? <laughs> Tremendous Talmud Chacham, writer, speaker, everything. So he's going to come. And he says, me and Rabbi Wine, we wrote a book recently. We wrote a book about Lithuania, about tells and... Kovna and Ponovich, and we want to sell the book. So on one of the sessions, you come, and you'll interview us, ask us about the book, and for 40 minutes, we'll talk about the book, and then, you know, we'll go outside. The books will be there. We'll sign them and sell them. It'll be wonderful. I said, of course. I'd be so happy to do it for you. Why not? Okay, I come to South Africa a couple days early before the Indaba starts, and I'm on a Jewish radio station, and... Right after I finish, here comes Rabbi Wine. He's the next one on the radio station. I said, oh, Rabbi Wine, I'm supposed to interview you someday. You want to tell me what questions I should ask you? It's always good to know what somebody's going to ask you. So Rabbi Wine, I don't know if you know him, but he's the coolest guy around. He says, whatever you want. You could ask me anything. I said, you don't want to know in advance? Nah, whatever you want. I just want to show you how cool he is. I remember the first time that I spoke with him on a program, I was so nervous. I said, I got to speak first because I can't speak after him. So I came, I covered the topic, I'm telling you, it was 55 minutes, I covered the whole topic. He gets up, he said, one sentence, and he had the whole audience in his back pocket. You know what he said? To this whole audience, 900 women. He said, you know, I learned a lesson in the rabbinate a long time ago. When the mile gets finished, there's very little left for the rabbi to do. <laughs> Jeff, a good line, right? So, and he had everybody in his back pocket. Okay, so now we come here, okay? 
And it's amazing. We in America must learn from the South Africans. They have these sessions a whole day Sunday, 9 o'clock. It starts exactly at 9, exactly at 10. I don't know how they do it. I know how they do it. You know how they do it? This is how they do it. The session starts at 9 o'clock. 9.30, there's a guy sitting right here. Holds up a big sign. 10 minutes left. Five minutes later, 9.35, he holds up a sign. Five minutes left. 9.40, the earth opens up, the speaker falls in, that's it. Every session began exactly on time. Now it's the four o'clock session. And I'm asking him the questions, you know, about the book. I'm here, and these two Rabbanim are sitting there. Then I see the sign, 4.30, 10 minutes left. 4.35, five minutes left. And now I realized I had my chance. I said, Rabbi Wein, we got five minutes left. I want to ask you a question that's been bothering me for 40 years. He looks up, 40 years? I said, yeah, 40 years. He said, ask. I said, Rabbi Wein, do you remember 40 years ago you were the rabbi in a big shul in Miami? And you called me up on Cholomot Pesach. You knew that I was a mohel. And you said to me, I need a mohel to come here to be for the last two days of the holiday of Pesach. Would you come and do a bris for somebody in my community? And I said, well, I'd be very happy to come. And I came, and I spent Yontif with your family, and we did the bris, it was beautiful. And then Matzah Yontif by Arbit, by Mayrif. I was standing around in your huge shul, and I looked around, and Rabbi Wine, I noticed something. You're the only man in Miami without a suntan. Now, I, said, I couldn't say he's all white because I was in South Africa, right? I don't want to get in trouble. So I said, it's amazing to me. You never go out of your house. You're always writing, teaching, making MP3s, making CDs, videos, newsletters, books, swarm. You don't stop. How could you not stop? Don't you ever get tired? You have produced in 40 years more than companies have produced. If you take a look at a Destiny Foundation, you know, you go on, on the website, it's, it's unimaginable that one person should do what this man has done. It's unimaginable. The other night, there was a, a, a special uh, dinner in Manhattan. He just became 80 years old. Hashem should bless him. You can't imagine. People came from all over the world. They were telling them of his. They came from Sao Paulo. They came from Zurich. They came from England. He's done so much. I said, don't you ever stop? Don't you get tired? He got very serious. He said, I want to tell you a story that happened to me when I was 11 years old. Listen to this. It's going to change your life. He said, when I was 11 years old, it's 1946, very important to remember. He said, I was 11 years old. I grew up in Chicago. And one day, my father says to me, we're going to the airport. I said, why are we going to the airport? He said, because a big tzaddik is coming to Chicago and he's going to address all the rabbis and all the yeshiva boys in Chicago. And he said, in those days, there were only 200 yeshiva boys in Chicago. Today, there would be thousands. But then in 1946, there was only 200. The elementary school kids, the high school, and the 200 boys in, uh, or the couple hundred, or whatever it was, the balance in Skokie Yeshiva. We all come to the airport. I said to my father, who's the Rav? He said, Rav Isaac Halevi Herzog, the Rav of Yerushalayim. He's going to give a shear to all the Rabbanim and the boys. We come to the airport, beautiful looking person, and there's a whole cavalcade of cars, and we come to the synagogue, and the rabbi gives a shiur. And after he gives a shiur, he says, now I want to speak to all of you, especially the boys. And he says, I just got back from Rome. I went to visit the Pope. It was Pope Pius, Yemach Shemoy. And he said, I said to the Pope, I've got the names of 10,000 Jewish boys and girls. Give me back these kids. These are our children. They survived the war and you have our children. And the Pope said, I'm not going to give you back even one. And he said, why not? You know that these are our children. Many of your people kidnapped these children. And many of the people, we gave the kids to your people because we didn't think we would survive. But give me back the boys and the girls. I've got the names of all of them. And the Pope said, I can't give you back even one. And I said, why not? And he said, because we have a rule that if any child has been baptized, then he can't give, be, be given back to any other religion. And all these 10,000 were baptized. Rabbi Herzog said, I begged him. I pleaded with him. And he wouldn't give me back even one. And then Rabbi Wine said, all of a sudden, Rabbi Herzog started crying. He said, I was never so scared in my life. I never saw a man cry like that. 
And he was crying, and everybody was quiet, and then he put down his head on the podium, and he just wept. He just cried. And everybody listened to him cry. He said, when he picked up his face, his face was red like a lion. And he looked out at everyone, and he said, I can't do anything for those 10,000 kids anymore. But what are you going to do for the future children of Klai Israel? So are you going to forget what I said? What are you going to do? You are the ones who could save the future children of the Jewish nation. I can't do anything for those 10,000, but you can save the future ones. And then he stopped. And everybody went up to shake his hand. And Rabbi Wine said, I don't know why, but when he shook my hand, he looked me straight in the face. He says, are you going to forget what I said? Are you going to remember what I said? What are you going to do for the children of Klai Yisrael? And Rabbi Wine said, Every time I get tired, every time I want to put down my pen, every time I want to put my head on my pillow, I'm haunted by those words. What are you going to do for the children of Claude Israel? And that's the question we have to ask each other tonight. It's not enough that our children and grandchildren are religious. What are we doing for the kids that are 35 miles away from here who don't even know what a Sefer Torah is, wouldn't even know what Shavuot was? It's not enough only the children and your grandchildren. It's the children of Klai Yisrael. That's the real hachana. That's the real preparation for Shavuot. Reach out. Kiruv. Welcoming in those that are not yet from is not only for Ish Torah and Chazak and Or Sameach. It's for every one of us. There's not one person in this room that doesn't have a second or a third cousin that's not religious. Call them before the holiday. Invite them. Send them a book. Send them a gift, something Jewish. Make them feel they're part of our nation. That's what Rabbi Isaac HaLevi Herzog was talking about. Hashem should bless each and every one of us. We should take these holy lessons with us. Let's make every day count. Every day with a chesed, every day with Torah, every day with reaching out to others. So then, by the time we get to Shavuot, it'll be Vayichan Shom Yisrael, Kla Yisrael will be there. Ki'ish Echad, Echad. One man, one heart. What kind of heart? A lev tov. 49 days of growth until we reach Derech Eretz Kodmala Torah and then we can be Makabel the Torah from Hashem. We should all be Makabel and then next year for Chazak we'll all be together in Yerushalayim with Mashiach and I'll let him be the main speaker. Thank you for inviting me.